Thank you for meeting with me today. First of all, I'm just curious, you know, people always have their own reasons why they want to talk, you know, about something that happened in their past. I'm just curious, like, why you agreed to talk to me, and I'm so thankful you did. You know, what made you want to talk about this? Um, because I'm going to get emotional. Um, it is a very difficult thing to go through, as you can well imagine. And there's homicide is something that happens in every demographic. And we're not alone as survivors. You know, when something happens and someone says, especially my job, well, I just lost somebody to homicide. I'm like, I can relate. Because there, now we have a level playing field. And my experience isn't the same as somebody else's, but it, depending on where they are in their healing process, I might be able to help them get through the tough time that they're going through. Who better to help them get through it than than you, from the experience? Right. You know, is that I'm curious. You know, you're a sheriff's office deputy. You know, long time in law enforcement by now. Did what happened with Karen lead to your career in law enforcement in any way? I think so. Um, it wasn't a conscious decision. One day I woke up and I was like, Yeah, I'm going to go into law enforcement. It was. Um, you know, initially I had, you know, when I went to college, I had graduated high school and I wanted to study psychology because I wanted to be a grief counselor. I wanted to help people. So at that point, when I graduated, I had already lost my sister brutally. And then I had lost my father in a plane crash, you know, both very sudden done They're They're now gone. And I went to this one therapist who is terrible. And, um, you know, I always tell people therapy is a very good thing, but you have to have the right connection. And it was very difficult for me to talk to this therapist because she had no idea what I was going through. You know, you can study what you can study and you can learn and help people learn coping skills. And anybody can do that if they get the, you know, the appropriate education. But there is just something that is on a completely different level when you lose somebody so tragically and at that point I had lost two in my life so that's what I wanted to do and then I played volleyball so I was like okay well I'll be a, a grief counselor and I'll help coach you know maybe I'll go work in a high school um, but the the bottom line was is that I, that's how I started my path and then of course life happens and I graduated from college and the last thing I wanted to do was another few years to get my master's in social work. I also found out how much money they make, which is not much, though that's funny now because now I'm a civil servant. <laughs> I probably make less. Um, so I kind of diverted away from that path and I worked in development and construction and then moved down uh, back to South Florida. We moved back to Boynton. That's when my mom moved in with my husband and me. And I started to get the bite of the law enforcement bug. And um, you know, I'm still very, very close with um, now Chief Lakata and with then Chief Rick Lincoln. And so I went and I did ride alongs at the town of Lantana and I met some really great people and I just didn't have the family support. So then when my husband and I moved down here to the Keys, I started a job in dispatch and my work husband, who is now a road patrol sergeant, he was like, you should go to the academy. And I was like, sure, why not? So I did, um, I sacrificed, I went to school um, during the day and I worked nights. So I worked um, a lot and ended up getting, um, you know, going ahead and graduating from the academy. It took us a year because it was part time and I slept maybe three hours a day for a year. I think I'm still trying to keep catch up Makes sense. and that was that I would graduate in 2014 and then that's when I went to road patrol and then detective and and now I'm back on the road with all of the detective skills that I've acquired and uh, a, a better understanding of how our process works tell me about your family Debbie you know brother are you the older sister to Karen younger you have a brother in the mix too tell me about your family so we were a typical family. 
it was my mom and my dad i had an older brother i had karen um there was um let's see he's 10 years older than me and then there was karen she was the middle child and then i was the baby so um, there was four years between me and karen and i'm sure i was just the annoying sister <laughs> i'm sure i was everything she did i had to do everything she did gymnastics i had to do gymnastics uh, she did cheerleading i had to do cheerleading um, she dove in high school i had to go dive and i always followed her path and um you know my brother was already out of the house by the time i was let's see seven or eight okay he um went into the navy he went over to texas he lived with my aunt and uncle and he worked on oil um, um what are they not oil rigs but out i don't know he worked in pastures <laughs> doing labor and he was like this sucks so he went into the navy my dad was a navy boy as well so he was gone and um so it was just me my sister and my parents in the house and um it would have that's why it's very strange because it's like i do have a brother but i mean he's very much like an older figure male figure in my life because i didn't really have him day to day so when you think about growing up, you think about your early childhood yes. with Karen. Yes. You worshipped her? I did. I did. Don't all little sisters worship their older sisters? We do. What was she like as a big sister, you know? Did she, was she sweet to you? Did she mentor you? What was she like as an older sister? Uh, I wish I could tell you. That's where it's, it gets hard because it's been... 39 years and my memory it's just unfortunately I, I have very little memories of her um, it was extremely difficult going through this because I didn't understand I was 10 I was 10 but she was she did a lot of stuff with her friends she was she was a teenager she was a teenager and she babysat. That was her thing. She babysat, she French braided, and she cheered. And, you know, she was only a freshman in high school. She was young. She was 14. What's your best memory with Karen? I know you said it's tough to get to some of them, but what is the, the bright spot you remember? Just a good day with Karen. So actually that day, we had gone to the Palm Beach Mall which um, I don't even know if it exists anymore um, because that's when you actually went to a mall and it was functioning and it was economically stable. And uh, we went Easter dress shopping because we always, always got new dresses for Easter. And we each got our dresses. And um, I remember when we got home, my mom was like, don't tell your dad, <laughs> which is so funny because I didn't understand now i understand as an adult it's like yeah don't tell dad how much money we just spent and um that that's like probably the last good memory that i that i have was us going shopping and i love shopping living down here we don't have shopping it's really terrible we have amazon <laughs> it was different then it was very different then very different and this was on the day of her death yes you went easter shopping easter, easter dress, dress shopping, shopping. yeah and in fact, for her funeral, I wore my Easter dress. Because that's what I wanted to wear. Do you remember what dresses you picked out? Like, is that memory still there? What I don't remember what she picked out, but I remember mine. It was very colorful, pastel pinks and yellows and greens and blues. And it had like a, um, a, a bib, I don't even know. It was just lace in the front. And, um, you know, we got the shoes that went with it. And then we had our Easter bonnets because that's what you wore at church. You know, we, we went to church every Sunday. Did Karen help you pick that dress or did you pick it all on your own? I don't remember. She probably picked it out. She was more fashion forward, you know, cause she was a teenager. So you went Easter dress shopping that day. What happened between the shopping and when she went off to babysit, were you together that afternoon or? I think we got back later in the afternoon. Um, we, 
she had to get back by a certain time because she was going to babysit. And, you know, of course, this was all before the time of cell phones. The cell phones weren't even a thing. And so, you know, we had to get back because we lived in Delray and it was, you know, it took some time to get there. And um, I don't, I don't remember. I know my mom dropped her off. I don't know what time it was. And then any, you know, any information that I have other than my own personal experience from that day is everything that I learned from the second trial. So do you have any memory of, again, you're 10 years old. Did your mom, how did you learn about what happened? Do you remember who said what to you when yes. you learned? Vividly. So I have to commend the Delray Beach Police Department because especially now being somebody who delivers death notifications, what they did is they went to my neighbor's house and woke them up because they didn't want t my family to hear it from the police. Because bad news, you know, anytime a law enforcement officer knocks on your door or makes a phone call, it's like, what's wrong? What happened? You know, either who died or who was arrested. And they, I don't know who made the decision, but somebody made the decision and they went and they um, went to, um, their names are Doris and Jim Wright, and they came over and they were with my parents. I couldn't tell you what time it was, um, but I do know that I was in my bedroom sleeping and I kept hearing this crying. And I was like, what is that noise? So finally I got up and I walked out and everybody was in the living room and my neighbor, Mrs. Wright, saw me and she, w she said, go back to bed, everything's fine. Okay, so went back to bed and then I, I kept hearing it and so I came out again and that's when my mom saw me and that's when she came running to me and grabbed me by my shoulder saying, she's dead, Karen's dead. And I was like, wait, what? What are you even talking about? I didn't understand. So Mrs. Wright brought me over next door. So I was with her daughter, Janae. She and I were very good friends and Janae had just found out and we, you know, just cuddled together on the bed. I just didn't understand. You were 10 years old. I was 10, I was fifth grade. I think I had just gotten braces that year. Like, I was little. You know, I look at 10-year-olds now and I'm just like, oh, you're so lucky you get to be a kid. Because I didn't. I didn't. Everything in my life changed after that. Our lives. The community's lives. I mean, this Karen's death affected the entire community. Our, our parish, all my friends, all of her friends. Nobody felt safe in Delray anymore. And that is when I think it was very evident that bad things can happen to good people and it doesn't matter. You know, she was in one of the most opulent neighborhoods in Delray and she was murdered. You're, nobody is safe, nobody. And that was a very, very scary thing for all of us to experience. I, I don't think I ever really babysat after that. Like, Would you? No, no. Not at all. In talking to Karen's loved ones, some of her former classmates, you know, they said word for word some of the things you just said that it spread in the community in a way nobody could have. I mean, it, it's cliche to say it rocked this community, but this is something they all said the entire community whether you knew karen you knew your family or not was impacted by this for 100%, a long time a very long time a very very long time because you know a child was murdered and was murdered in a nice neighborhood and contributed nothing to her death nothing she just was in the house that he broke into and he wanted to murder her that is the bottom line. And nobody can protect themselves from that. Nobody. And that's scary. Terrifying. It is. It's absolutely terrifying. 
How did your family and you, you know, go on in those days that followed? Like, what is it a blur to you? Are there certain things you remember? I just, you know, how do you move on and wake up every day as a family, you know, going through that? I don't know how my mom and dad did it. I have no idea. I, they still had to trudge along because of me. And, you know, my, I, what I remember in the days following was, so I have a very big family. My mom is one of 11, my dad was one of eight. Yeah. So my mom's family all came down. So we had all these people that were at our house and, you know, in our backyard. And I'm sure they were probably super happy to come back from New York because this was in March and it was probably cold there. <laughs> um, but I remember the family being there, you know, my dad's family, my mom's family, all my cousins, my aunts, my uncles. Um, for me, it just seemed that, um, you know, it was business as usual. I just had a lot of family around because I didn't really process what was going on. In my mind, Karen was away at camp. She was just away at camp. She was at gymnastics camp because we had gone to gymnastics camp, I think like two years prior um, in Pennsylvania. And I was like, she's at camp. And that's how I was able to cope with everything. And my, I, I have no idea how my mom and my dad did it. I have no idea. I, I don't, I can't even imagine if something like that happened to my daughter. Thinking about it now as an adult and a mom, and then thinking back to it, you know, when you were 10 and you, you know, you described just the confusion of it all. You know, when you think about it now, mm -hmm. how do you think about it differently when you think of like 10 year old Debbie, you know, how do you, how do you think about it now compared to when you were a child and it was just confusing then? Well, obviously, I know every single detail as to what happened. Um, more information than probably anybody should know. Um, when the first trial, my parents, my family did not want me there. And I can understand because I think it was like maybe I think when it came down to it, I don't even know what year the first trial was. Um, I think it was like 87 or 88. Um, that's just a little bit too much to hear brutal testimony. And then as I've gotten older, I think it was after that second trial was when the, the weight of it all hit me. Now I had already been married. So now here we are, it's like 1998, I think it was, and I'm going through this all over again as if it just happened. And now I'm experiencing it as a 24 year old and not a 10 year old. And you know, what I've learned through grief therapy, especially when somebody loses somebody young in each phase of your life, you're re, I don't wanna say triggered because I hate that. Triggered, woke, shook. No, it's just in the true sense of the word is as you grow and develop into each different stage of your life, you go through that loss all over again because it affects one differently. So, you know, when I was 16 and I found out he was granted a new trial, um, it hit me again. And it was then my mom and I actually went and we listened to the testimony or the presentation to the Florida Supreme Court. And I learned, it was all about the confession. I learned that day the difference between equivocal and unequivocal statements, which obviously in my job now is a big deal. Um, but the Florida Supreme Court at that point, so now I'm 16 and I'm dealing with this and they say, well, we're giving him a new trial. That trial didn't happen until 1998. So this was 1989, 1990, eight years later. And I mean, this process has been completely slow the entire time. And it's extremely, extremely frustrating. So when we were in the second trial, I was living it all over again. And I'm sure my mom was too, my brother. 
you know, my brother was on an aircraft carrier off the coast of Beirut and he had to be flown in. We had to, I guess they had to get senators or congressmen or somebody to get him off of that, that aircraft carrier to bring him home to us. So I can't even imagine what he went through. And then, you know, having to go back. But he was there. It was my mom, my husband, my brother, my um, some dear friends of our family who had lost their daughter to a drunk driver. They were at that trial every single day. And the only time that my mom and I and my brother left the courtroom was during the medical examiner testimony. My brother started, he couldn't finish, he left, and so my husband stayed. And he said that it was the worst testimony he had ever heard. But he felt compelled to sit there and listen because he wanted Karen to be represented. And he was, he was a good man. So it's been, it's been hard. I mean, the fact that we're, you know, like two and a half weeks away from an execution, I just, honestly, I don't think it's gonna happen. I think something, I don't think it's gonna happen. We'll see, but I don't think it's gonna happen. Is this what the family wants to happen? Yes, without a doubt, without a doubt. He looked into my sister's eyes when she died and I will look into his eyes when he dies. That's just it. You are going to be there. Mm -hmm. Your mother's going to be there? No. What other family members will be with you? It'll be just me. How do you feel about that being the, how do you feel about that being the person there, Karen's person there that day? I'm not even sure. It's hard to process those feelings because I haven't gotten there yet. But whether I agreed with the death penalty or not, which I do, of course, this is his sentence. This is what he was sentenced to. And our justice system says it needs to play out. And I will be there to represent her. I have to. If I didn't, I would never forgive myself. What brings Karen to mind over the years? Are there certain things where she comes to mind? Yes, many things, like little gems here and there. Every time I see a rainbow, every time I see a female cardinal, um, it was funny, so <laughs> I'm like an old person with my birds. <laughs> I have like three bird feeders. And it was really interesting because right after my husband had passed and we had lost um, Rick next door to cancer, we had three male cardinals and one female that would come and feed off of our bird feeders. And I just felt that that was them coming back to us because supposedly that's what they do. Um, so a female cardinal, rainbows, um, my daughter with the weight that she is with kids. She wants to be a kindergarten teacher. I told her no, because <laughs> she will never be financially dependent upon somebody else. She needs to get a career where she can be financially independent, but she is so good with kids and she's really good with special needs kids. Um, her language, she says um, she's gonna take a sign language. Yeah. She talks with her hands anyway, so it's appropriate. <laughs> Tell me about the bond. We were talking about this a little earlier between you, your mom, your daughter. Um, it is a relationship singular, right? Yes. Um, not just because of what you've been through with Karen, but also your husband, mm -hmm. your father. What has that meant for this relationship between the three of you? Girl power. <laughs> I mean, up until we got our two cats, even all of our animals were females. Like it, it's, a, it's a girl household, you know, we're the Johnson Slattery girls. Um, I think even on my stamp that I do for return mail, it's the Johnson Slattery girls. Um, my mom, 
is one of the strongest women I know. And I'm pretty strong physically, mentally, emotionally. You know, certain things break me down, of course. But we have been able to teach my daughter to stand on her own two feet. And I think that's something, especially in today's day, everybody has to be able to stand on their own two feet. And we are very, very fortunate that, you know, we have a beautiful place to live and we have a good life. And we're able to give my Kate a pretty stress-free life. She's so beautiful and I love the way you talk about her. Like you have the, the glimmer in your eye when you talk about your daughter, just you're so proud of her. I am, she is, she is the best of her dad and me and she is a really, really awesome kid. She really is, I'm very, very blessed. She's very blessed to have you as her mama, oh, too. Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to ask you about one other thing with um, your mom. There's a writer, um, his name's Randy Schultz, who wrote, has written about this case at length for the Coastal Star. And he wrote about like a phone call that your mom had with Karen. Mm -hmm. Do you know, what can you tell me about that phone call? I think what, you know, my mom and I don't really talk about it. Um, I think it's just too painful for both of us. Um, but I think they used to always talk at like 11 o'clock. And, and that was the one thing that I thought was so terrible during the first trial was because my mom was a witness, she couldn't be in the courtroom. So there she was out sitting by herself. And it's already so isolating being a victim of a homicide or homicide survivor family to have her out there. You know, thankfully now victims' rights have changed and it was in 1984 when um, the Victims of Crime Act was, was signed by Ronald Reagan. So things were very different. But I know that the reason why was because that established the timeline. You know, and obviously now in my job, I understand it even more so from the investigative purpose or the investigative side. So that was, we knew at 11 o'clock that Karen had spoken to my mom. And I'm sure it was probably just everything's fine, the kids are asleep, um, just waiting for Mr. and Mrs. Home to come home. And um, you know what they actually spoke about, I don't know. My mom always went to bed early. <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> I can relate too. What year did you guys move here to Isla Morada? 2011. Why did you move here? Why did you leave South Florida? Um, well, my, my husband was an airline pilot for Comair Airlines, which was a Delta subsidiary. And um, they were, Comair was starting to do buyouts with pilots. And my husband was like, Debbie, I really think that I should probably retire. And he was young. I mean, he was only like 38, 39. And uh, he called it his retirement. It was a payout. And he, was, he said, you know, I'm concerned if I don't take this payout now, then I'm gonna be without a job. And so we had been coming down here um, for like 10 or 15 years because he was a big fisherman, a big fly fisherman, um, especially for tarpon. So we had already established a friend base here. And he said, I, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the buyout and become a fishing guide in Isla Mirada, which is very cutthroat down here, at least it used to be. And because of his charisma, he was able to, also with a very dear friend, Steve Friedman, who was also um, a captain, he was great. And kind of, you know, tucked him under his wing and said, this is how we do things. And he was very well respected. He was an excellent fisherman. He was good at anything he did, anything. And so um, he moved down here first and he was still commuting. He would just fly out of Miami. Um, he was based out of JFK and then he got the payout and he was down here full time. Kate finished her school year. I think it was first grade. And um, I had just lost my job and I was like, let's find a house. Kind of made sense. Yeah. Was there any thought to, you, know, you were leaving behind. Yes. Tell me about that. You know, I think about it a lot because my dad 
after Karen died, had purchased plots at the cemetery for all of us. And my mom would go to the cemetery pretty much daily. And she would go visit my dad and my sister. And the thought of taking her away from that, it's very upsetting because that was something that she did. And I haven't been to the, the, um, the cemetery since my dad died maybe once or twice. I can't, I emotionally cannot do it. Um, just the physical presence of where they are and just, I, I remember in different ways, but that's how my mom coped. So when she moved down here, we did, we took that away from her and you know, she's a big girl. She made her own decisions, but it is still something that bothers me. You know, and I think if I leave the keys, um, you know, if I move somewhere in the state of Florida or if I leave the state, then we're leaving them behind too. And it's hard. It seems so silly, but it is something that I have been thinking about more and more lately, you know, because I don't want to be buried. I want to be cremated, but I already have a plot that my dad bought, you know, and it doesn't seem know. silly at all. <laughs> Debbie, I just, I hope this comes across the right way. Everything you've been through, how do you do it? <laughs> you are sitting here talking to me today. You're, you are so strong. Like your strength has come through from the moment I spoke to you on the phone. How do you, you're clearly like such a loving mom. You, how do you do it after everything this family has been through? I go through life as a survivor and not a victim. Anybody could have crumbled under just one of the tragedies that I've been through or my mom has been through. And my mom definitely taught me that you got to put on your big girl panties and you got to move on. And, you know, I've been told that I'm an inspiration to a lot of people who are going through a hard time because they're like, if Debbie can do it, then I can do it. Um, I just refuse to be a victim. I am smart, I am capable, and I am going to constantly get up for as long as God will allow me, put my feet on the floor, and I will go to work, I will live my life, and hopefully make the world a little bit better of a, a place than it was the day before. Thank you so much for your time today and for just painting some beautiful memories of Karen and your entire family, thank you.